Okay, good afternoon everyone. I see we have quite an online audience today. Um, welcome to today's new meeting on knowledge, attitudes and practices regarding alcohol abuse amongst undergrad students at South African University. So um, maybe just to give a big, a bit of background before I introduce our speakers. Um, it was in 2020 when um, you know, we were in the throes of the COVID pandemic, um, a COVID-19 health advisory group was formed in UCT and I was part of that group. And at one point we had to make recommendations about alcohol restrictions um, for UCT when we were emerging out of the hard lockdown. Um, and it was a tricky situation because at that time there was the tin roof saga that some of you may remember where um, high school students uh, had been using alcohol at a, a local nightclub and this became a super spreader event. Um, and it was during the discussions around this that um, there was a recognition that beyond COVID, the issue of alcohol use amongst young people was a big issue that we needed to explore and understand better and address better. And so that sparked the idea of this interest of this, this research topic. And it um, I presented it to our health and content students in fourth year. And they ran with it. Um, in health and context, normally the students just develop the protocol. Um, but we have this group of enthusiastic students who then decided to go forward with their protocol. And over the past two years, in their own time and in their elective time, have conducted the research, analyzed the results, and have some findings to present. And so I'm very, very proud of them. So I'd like to introduce the Sisiwe and Robin, who are here in person. <laughs> Online, we have um, Niju, uh, Daniel Kuti, and Bukle and Bukla. I'm not sure if Bukle's on yet. Um, and their other team member is Melissa Ferreira. Um, so very, very warm welcome to them. Unfortunately, three of the students are doing their garden roots rotation, which is why they are not um, here in person, uh, but they're planning to join online. But fortunately, um, despite the flooding and all kinds of challenges, <laughs> Bussy and Robin have made it to Cape Town to be lab in person, and I will hand over to you guys. Well done. Thanks, Dr. Um, hi, everyone. So we're just going to get started then. So as Dr. Jake mentioned, we did a study that's not showing. Here we go. Okay. Cool. So as Dr. David mentioned, our study is on um, it's a CAP study, so the knowledge, attitudes, and practices regarding alcohol use among undergrad students at the South African University. Um, we're going to go through our study, the background behind it, our reading that went into um, sort of our literature review before, the objectives that we had for ourselves, um, our methods, our results, and then the conclusions that we've drawn. We're also going to share an advocacy message that we've sort of, that's sort of come out of our research, our acknowledgements, um, the support that we've had during the study, and then some notes on why we as a group decided after fourth year to continue with the research. Um, so starting with the background of our study, um, as Dr. Jacob mentioned, our study topic was suggested by our fourth year public health um, course convener, so Dr. Jacob, our site facilitator here and our stakeholders at UCT Student Wellness. And then we read further into the topic to expand our knowledge of alcohol use in South Africa. And um, there were some areas that were highlighted that we felt needed further research. So just a little bit of background of alcohol use in South Africa. We started by um, noticing a lot of research on the, the the harms of alcohol use. And in the South African context, it links um, very closely to the quadruple burden of disease in South Africa. So the link to non-communicable diseases, alcohol is a risk factor for multiple lifestyle diseases like cardiovascular disease, liver disease, psych conditions, and um, communicable diseases as well, as Dr. Jacobs mentioned in the COVID pandemic that was um, on everybody's tongues, but the impact on infectious diseases, also like HIV and other STIs, risky behavior, health behavior, and poor adherence. And then the link between alcohol and maternal and child health, there was a lot of research on that, especially just highlighting that South Africa has the highest prevalence of fetal alcohol syndrome in the world, so alcohol being a risk factor uh, for maternal and child health as well. And then alcohol is a risk for trauma, especially during COVID when we were noticing documented decrease in trauma visits during the alcohol restrictions. That was quite noticeable in our reading. And then just the background that we found on alcohol use in South Africa as it stands, um, we found that 
according to the research we read, a third of the South African population admitted to drinking, and 50% of this group admitted to binge drinking. But importantly, in our reading, we also noticed that it seemed to be that it started in young people and that there was already a 21% prevalence of drinking in people aged 15 to 19, and that the, the prevalence of alcohol use peaked in the age group of 20 to 24 years old, which turned out to be around the median of the, the study population in our study. Um, but our reading also highlighted a need for more research. We found extensive information on alcohol use among students worldwide, but very, very few studies specific to alcohol use in our South African university context. And the objectives that we sort of laid out for ourselves for this study, um, we wanted to determine the knowledge, attitudes, and practices um, among undergraduate students at a local SA university. So we wanted to first ask questions and determine the demographic and academic profile of our study population. We wanted to ask questions around the knowledge that our study population had regarding alcohol and alcohol use to explore the attitudes towards alcohol use and misuse among undergraduate students at UCT and to determine the alcohol use practices of the undergraduate <coughs> students as well. And then explore any relationships between the demographic and factors and the knowledge and attitudes and practices of these students. So in terms of the methods of our study, so for the design we use a descriptive cross-sectional study using a self-administered anonymized online questionnaire. And our questionnaire had questions which explored knowledge and attitude regarding alcohol use, as well as some screening questions from the orders tool, which is a validated tool, to identify hazardous or harmful alcohol practices within the student population. So our participants were all undergraduate students at the university who were 18 years or older. Um, we invited participants to the study via the institutional email, and our study was advertised on social media, including WhatsApp and Instagram and posters on institutional online educational platform. And then a minimum sample size of 384 students was needed to make any meaningful analysis because the population of undergraduate students is 16,310. So our data was analyzed in Microsoft Excel as well as Genovi, and our numerical data was analyzed with measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion, while our categorical variables were analyzed with frequency tables and two by two contingency tables. And then we also used chi-square tests and Fisher's exact tests um, to evaluate the um, relevant associations. And then our research protocol was approved by the local university human research ethics committee and there's our relevant number and the study was also approved by the university's department of student affairs and any risk that was posed by a sensitive nature of the content in the questionnaire was addressed by provision of electronic information sheet um, with contact details of accessible support structures um, for students Moving on to the results, we definitely found our results quite interesting. So in terms of the demographics, the um, demographic sort of profile of our study population, we had 405 responses of the 16,000, just over 16,000 students in total and undergraduate um, level. 378 of these were included. Some hadn't completed enough of the questionnaire for us to analyze, so we excluded 27 of these. As Bussi said, we needed 384 for an adequately powered analysis, so there was a slightly lower response than that, but we were, um, were happy with our population of, of the university students. And then in terms of the demographics, a bit more detail, as I mentioned, the mean, sorry, the median age was 22. The biggest uh, category of, of age of our respondents was 21 to 29 years old. And the majority of the respondents were female, so just under 65% of our respondents were female. And then in terms of the faculties that responded, we did have, it's important to acknowledge that the majority of our respondents were from the Faculty of Health Sciences. I'll touch again on this later um, with limitations, but it was about 57% were from the Faculty of Health Sciences, followed by Humanities and then Science. In terms of residents, so we asked about student residents during academic terms 
about just under a third were UCT or were university resident students. And then the rest, the other 68% were from private residents, either um, communal private accommodation or with their parents or living alone in private residence. We also asked about the students' homes, so where they lived outside of academic terms, where they were from outside of university. 87% of the majority were from urban areas outside of academic terms, and the remaining 12% were from self proclaimed rural areas. Then moving on to the results in terms of the knowledge section of our study, um, we asked, there's two questions that I'm going to sort of touch on the results of. First question we asked, we asked about the number of units of alcohol, or we asked students to estimate the number of units of alcohol in um, a can of beer, a glass of wine, and then a shot of spirits. So firstly, one third of the participants didn't answer this question for whatever reason, whether they didn't know or they didn't want to. The majority of the participants as a whole, so 50% and 59% respectively, underestimated the number of standard units of alcohol in beer and in wine. Whereas with spirits, very few students, as you can see with the blue there, um, underestimated the number of units in a shot of spirits. Many students correctly stated one unit in one shot, but what's important here is a greater proportion um, of participants overestimated the standard units of alcohol in a 40 ml shot of spirits compared to the other alcohol types. So um, the belief was that shots or, or spirits are more potent than the other forms of alcohol, beer and wine. The other interesting thing that we found was that males were statistically more likely to underestimate the standard units of alcohol in beer and participants from urban areas versus rural areas were also significantly more likely to underestimate the number of units of alcohol in beer and wine compared to participants from rural home. Then the next question we asked participants to estimate, this was two separate questions, estimate the maximum number of drinks that males can safely drink in a week and then that females can safely drink in a week. So firstly, of the responders, the majority actually underestimated the number of alcohol that can be safely consumed in one week. So the mean response for males was 10 units in a week, whereas the actual answer, according to our background reading, was 21. And the mean response that participants answered for females was 7.5 units that can be safely drunk in a week, but the actual answer is 14. Um, then what was interesting was just under 20% estimated that males and females shared the same maximum limit for drinks that can be safely consumed in a week. And then just over 80% responded um, correctly that or estimated that a higher, there's a higher maximum number of, of drinks that can be safely consumed in a week for males compared to females. And no participants answered that females have a higher maximum safe limit than males do. Okay, moving on to the attitudes part. Um, this is a bit small, so I will run you through um, what this table means. So of all the participants who responded to our question of the attitudes, 74.6% of them agreed that students who use alcohol are at a higher risk of having health problems. And then 78 of the people who answered this question believe that students using alcohol would have negative health outcomes later in life. Um, and then 89.5 percent of students um, responded expressed concern about the negative outcomes of alcohol consumption. 48.8 percent believed that alcohol should be allowed on campus. 28.4 um, percent disagreed. 28.8 percent remained neutral on whether or not alcohol can be consumed on campus or not. And then 65 percent of the participants did not believe that alcohol marketing strategies influence their alcohol consumption at all. And overall, about 25.1% of resident students indicated using alcohol as a coping mechanism for stress and anxiety in comparison to 14.7% of students who lived off campus. Um, and what we find quite interesting about this was that the negative effects of alcohol were less acknowledged by those who were engaging in harmful or hazardous drinking and these students were also more likely to want alcohol on campus. Um, so this demonstrated some kind of need to improve the awareness of harmful effects of alcohol before we initiate any alcohol use. 
Um, but we also noticed, and we'll discuss a bit later, was that a weakness in this was that we actually didn't query a person's age of their first drink, um, which could have been interesting to see how this could have affected their attitude. Okay, and this um, graph shows um, the stresses that trigger alcohol use among undergraduate students. So we had 247 participants responding to this question. And 48.6% of them stated that they had no specific stresses that triggered alcohol consumption. And um, the relationship stress was the most frequently identified stressor that led to alcohol use. And then our third last, well, lowest um, response was mental health issues. And those mental health issues that were recorded included social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, as well as attention deficits, that sharper sensitivity disorder and depression. And then our category which says other um, included physical pain or dealing with work-related trauma as well as racism. So these are the stresses that the students identified. And then this figure um, shows locations where alcohol advertising was encountered by the participants um, six months prior to them completing the questionnaire. Um, so 66.7% of participants were exposed to alcohol marketing and 65% of the participants didn't believe that al alcohol marketing influenced their alcohol consumption at all. Um, and the locations where participants mainly encountered alcohol advertising includes television or movies, which was at 56.3%. Um, as well as from special offers that they encountered that they were buying alcoholic beverages, um, as well as sports sponsorships. And what was quite interesting was that um, we know that there is like the rise of the digital age. Um, so we we're wondering how that will, in, that will influence future um, alcohol marketing campaigns, and um, especially with them possibly targeting um, females more. Um, and, and targeting how, um, I guess, attitudes, targeting different populations um, more uniquely than um, your special offers or TV or movies um, would do. And then these are a couple of tables that show our practices. So we had 78.9% of our participants saying that they had consumed alcohol, and 14.4% of those who had consumed alcohol said so that they consumed alcohol up to three times a week. Um, and a significant amount of our population was just under 50% um, engaged in binge drinking, which is quite concerning because this means that it leaves our undergraduate students at risk of experiencing the harmful consequences associated with alcohol use. Um, those living in off campus residences, um, communal or private accommodation, they were more likely to have ever consumed alcohol than those living at home or in university race. Um, male students were more likely to engage in binge drinking, which is six or more drinks on an occasion, than female students. Um, but we also find interesting was that social interactions with peers were a big part of the university experience and had big, huge impacts on um, drinking behavior for students across sex, age, faculty, and areas of student living. Students reported that they consumed more alcohol at students' events compared to at home while in university residence. Um, and drinking, sorry, I lost my face. Um, 81.3% of participants um, so that they participated in pre-drinks and 69.6% of participants also re reported drinking more um, when they participate in these pre-drinks. Um, alcohol was mostly consumed on Fridays and Saturdays, which are days which are typically used as time for relaxation and socialization, um, which also may influence um, how people drink more in social settings. Um, And then this was a table showing um, which alcoholic beverages were consumed by students. Um, so the most consumed alcoholic beverages were wine, cocktails, and gin. And then other beverages included um, liqueurs or champagne or rums. 86% um, of participants consumed alcohol on social events and alcohol when consumed on Saturdays. Um, So 
So now with our practices also included the orders tool. Um, so of the 257 participants that responded to this, 11.7% um, of students screened positive for harmful or hazardous drinking, while 8.6% of the participants were likely had alcohol dependence. Male students were more likely to have harmful or hazardous drinking um, or alcohol dependence in comparison to female students. Um, the year of study or the age and the faculty wasn't significantly associated with more frequent drinking or um, hazardous drinking. Um, students with harmful or hazardous drinking were also more likely to acknowledge the negative health risks of alcohol and the negative health out outcomes of alcohol when they're older. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, students with the harmful or hazardous drinking and alcohol dependence, they were more likely to want alcohol at campus events than students who had no harmful drinking. And the students with the harmful or hazardous drinking, as well as students with likely alcohol dependence, they were also more likely to acknowledge the influence of advertising on their, on their drinking than those who had no harmful drinking at all. So um, students drinking, so the, the perceived benefits of alcohol use and alcohol intoxication play a significant role in students' drinking behaviour. Um, students consider this alcohol consumption as icebreakers um, and so, and which calls into question the reason why students feel that they are unable to engage equally with other peers in the absence of alcohol. Um, and students drinking only to get drunk is concerning and warrants further investigation into factors which influence the need to escape the reality. Um, and this may affect underlying and unaddressed mental health issues among university students an environment which is not tailored to students over while while living. So in terms of our conclusions, so students' knowledge regarding alcohol use is lacking. There was a general misunderstanding of the potency of alcohol, especially among males with regards to beer. Um, alcohol use is a common practice among undergraduate students despite the associated risks. And despite students' recognition of the harmful effects of alcohol, the misuse is still a common behaviour among students. Students consume more alcohol at social events than at home or at university residences, possibly attributing to um, social interactions as well as less restrictions and supervision in these areas. Um, and these and other factors related to hazardous alcohol use, such as sex and residence, may guide stakeholders to implement tailored interventions and appropriate policy changes, um, and that there is systematic evaluation and regular surveillance of the drinking culture in South African universities in order to effectively promote health behaviours and to prevent alcohol-related harms, especially considering findings suggesting that alcohol advertising may influence drinking practices among those who have hazardous drinking. Yes, so just to acknowledge some of the limitations that we had in our study. To acknowledge the small sample size, so the, the 405 responses out of 16,000 students and the low response rate, but as we said, uh, we felt our study was adequately powered, it was just under that, that limit, and we had significant results, statistically significant results. And um, then we also did acknowledge that of those who did respond, a large proportion represented the Faculty of Health Sciences, so we feel that this could have been because of an increased advertisement effort within the Faculty of Health Sciences, given that we are five health sciences students and, and some or a lot of our advertising happened by social media. We also acknowledge that health sciences students may have a broader understanding of the effects of alcohol on health given their training, and this might have influenced um, their likelihood to be part of the study and the answers that they might have given. And we also acknowledge the voluntary nature of participation might have introduced selection bias to our study. Our data was collected using a self-administered questionnaire, which can also um, introduce recall and social desirability bias. The questionnaire, especially the attitude section, used liquid type questions with odd number responses, which can also introduce central tendency bias. And um, a higher or a higher non Item non-response bias was introduced due to participants having the choice to not respond to all questions. 
So in terms of our advocacy message, um, so health promotion interventions are needed to inform students about the harmful alcohol practices, as well as um, providing support for students who do require it. Um, as well as regular screening opportunities. Um, these may assist in early detection and management of harmful drinking for students. And then we're also suggesting a systematic evaluation and regular surveillance of the drinking culture in universities. So acknowledgement, I mean, we don't have to go through this too much, but we as the students definitely want to thank and acknowledge Nisha Jacob. She's been with us from the start in four year and I don't think we would have gone through with the study without no. encouragement. <laughs> I also want to thank Prof London for his feedback. It's made a huge difference to our study and it's made us feel more confident with what we've been doing. We really appreciate the time taken to do that. Fiona Yordan, who was our site facilitator in fourth year, we really appreciate you as well for all of your encouragements. Then Memory, Ishaq and Dominique um, from the Student Wellness Center and James Earlham, who's our um, elective convener for allowing us to complete this research during our elective time, which has um, given us a lot more exposure to, to research in an academic setting. Um, so in terms of our notes about why we think that we completed the study, so the benefits of our supervisor encouraging us a lot, um, we think played a huge role because having someone who thinks you're capable makes you think that you're capable, even though you even if you don't really think you're capable of this. Um, and then exposure to writing a research protocol was useful, but exposure to conducting and writing up a study is completely different. So we understood the value of having exposure to this research for our future, so for our CVs, because um, we were the medical student group that didn't have the SSM projects in third year. So this really was our first exposure to um, research and very valuable for the fact that we get to graduate med school with more than just medical knowledge. <laughs> um, and then having a topic that interests us was useful. Um, so we were actually considering should we consider allowing students to choose their own topic in fourth year because one of the main reasons why we conducted this was because ourselves we wanted to know what the outcomes were. So um, maybe that played a big role in us um, completing the study. And then lastly, our student population was easily accessible. So um, we could literally just send an email um, and then the entire population was able to have access to our questionnaire. Um, so we think that also played a role in us completing this study. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Um, thank you very much to Bussy and Robin for being here today and also to uh, Lidu Boucher and um, Melissa. Um, for their part in the team. So let's just uh, go into our team's page so we can see um, some comments. Um, um, so just to say, we are really proud of the work that you guys have done. Um, it's um, not easy for undergraduate students to take this part, um, but you've been really uh, committed to following through and I'm really, um, really proud of your perseverance um, and your dedication. Um, and, you know, there's been lots of challenges along the way that you've all faced, especially being split up as final years um, this year, but you still managed to come together as a team and I've been very impressed with the work ethic and the group dynamic. This group has really worked well together um, and that made supervising them a pleasure. So well done to you guys. I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of you and I, I'm Hope you continue to inspire more of our undergrads to, to do this and we're going to feed all of this information into our faculty conversations around um, curriculum transformation. So we really appreciate the feedback on the research process. But I'd like to open up for um, questions. Um, there's a couple of comments already in the, in the chat. I see Prof London's hand is up, so Prof, you can unmute and ask. So just to congratulate the students again, fantastic project. It was really good. Um, uh, uh, I uh, hope that you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just hang on. Um, let me just get the zoom. Oh my God. Just if you can turn the volume up on there. Sure. Uh, we can hear you online, yeah. Leslie. Ah, okay. I normally 
probably have a problem with my webcam. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, Prof. Lavin is going to rejoin. So, can I ask Fiona? I uh, see you've made a comment. In, um, are you able to just comment and switch your camera around and just say a few words, Fiona, as their site facilitator for the fourth year protocol? Yeah. Uh, Hi, Nisha. Yes, I'm able to comment. Are you all able to hear me? Uh, we can't hear you, Fiona. Just hang on. We can't. Uh, let me maybe. Huh? Yeah, can you say something else? Hello? Um. Hello, Fiona. We can hear you online. <laughs> okay, Fiona, you can, can go, hear you too. go ahead. Hi, is everyone able to hear me? Yes, we can. All right, I just want to give you a hand and say, well done, Team GP. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> if I think back, it was the midst the pandemic two years ago. If I'm correct, Block 3 2021 was winter. <laughs> it was not easy. We were online, hardly met face to face. And in fact, all the meetings were online. Uh, and then I remember first time you heard about your the topic. You were surprised that it was your own UCT community. Like, and you thought you're going to do some something or make it a difference or do in the in, in a community, a particular community. And you all looked at me like, but why the UCT community? And I think today you can say it was worth the while because sometimes that the saying goes, uh, it starts at home. Sometimes we forget about our own communities. We want to go all over and we think we can change the world. And yet sometimes here right in front of us, we don't see what is needed. So well done team. Thank you for putting in the effort. I know it was not easy. I know after fourth year, this, it all increases and yet you take, took that time to put in. So from my side, I'm very honored to sit and watch you here today. And please, what you've learned from this experience, take it with you. You can only better on it. Well done. There we go. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And you were right all along that having the UCT students as our population actually turned out to be a great thing and it, it maintained our interest in it because it was our own population. So you were right. <laughs> great. Um, Prof. London, go for it. You had a question earlier. Uh, well, just to echo. I am echoing, obviously. <laughs> that uh, it was a fantastic project. I hope that the students will feel confident enough to publish as well, to write it up for publication. And Nisha, you're going to help them, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so just to say, we had an um, elective group that looked at vaping, and Virginia actually suggested they look at co-risks. I think many of the risks that students have at UCT or at universities are shared. Um, I think it's not just for curriculum, this is important, but it also can help inform policy at UCT on uh, alcohol availability, uh, because um, there was actually a complaint at one of the other universities about alcohol not being available to students, and they quoted UCT as being a university where alcohol was available. So it's interesting, and I think it'll come to senior management at some point. So well done, very well done. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Prof. Um, it's Huck. I see your hand is up. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to. I just wanted to congratulate the, the, the group. I think that um, I first want to say I'm incredibly proud of them and this achievement. I actually gave them a virtual standing ovation. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, the results of the study, uh, this study is very significant. And and yeah, I think that, um, you know, perhaps um, the students, if they may have time in the future, be 
consultant for or stakeholders for students that might want to do health education type of interventions uh, um, on, on, on this project uh, or, or on this topic uh, going forward. Uh, but really well done. I think for you to have taken your project from the fourth year protocol phase to a project completion phase is amazing. And I'm really, really incredibly proud of you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Isak. Um, Memory, I see you've made a comment in the chat. Um, and I just wondered, as someone from Student Wellness, so perhaps I should maybe be upfront that the students have deliberately um, tried to not mention UCT's name in, in the presentation and in the posters that they've created and so forth, um, so as not to have any impact on reputational issues and so forth. Um, but I think it, those who would have um, engaged with us over this process will be aware that this is exactly what's based at UCT um, and uh, memory uh, from student wellness is one of our key stakeholders. And I wondered if you had any comments that you'd like to share memory? Thank you, Nisha. I was really um, posting my congratulations to the students and all of you in supervising um, this project so far. And um, indeed, I think as per our discussions, we really struggle around alcohol. And um, the issue of alcohol in residencies has been debated, not just at UCT, but also across other universities in the country. And it's been quite diverse. And so it is something that should be looked at. But however, it is quite important for us to look at what sort of interventions around drinking responsibly on campus um, could be sent out and what is more um, student informed and student led where students would be able to acquire knowledge without feeling um, as though it is being detected and made into policy and rule etc and so I think uh, some of the interventions that this debate and these results um, can can be taken in other forums um, like the mental health policy forum etc to start looking at what are those interventions interventions that could be more student driven. So thank you very much. This is a good initiative. I had no idea when we started discussions that it would lead to this type of a full research with results and also perhaps a publication. So thank you, Nisha, and thank you to all the students involved. Thank you very much, Memory, for all that input and your support of the students as well as they took this project through from fourth year. Um, Rino, I see you've made a very interesting comment in the chat. No alcohol in residences, no alcohol at faculty events, no alcohol at university events. And one of our students in this group who's um, in the garden root rotation, Vidyu, has said as a student, I feel this will cause an uproar. But I know, um, Rino, as you know, in your previous role at UCT, you, uh, you likely faced um, a lot of these kind of issues uh, head on. And I wondered if you'd like to comment further on that. I mean, the student, I hope everybody can hear me well. Thanks to the students for the project. And the response of the student is absolutely correct. It will cause an uproar. Um, but, uh, but, but I was being deliberately provocative and um, memory will well remember the debate. Uh, you know, when I was there, you can see the branding is obviously different now, Anisha. When I chaired the uh, COVID coordinating committee, the intense debate around... Um, you know, uh, permitting alcohol uh, at that time. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that we would make a hard decision around not having alcohol on, in residence based on the issue of social distancing. And once that issue goes away, then we have the difficult conversations about whether it is permissible in residences at faculty events and university events. I, I think also if you want to set an example, and that's my personal view, uh, we would have to engage as faculty members and as university members and make that conversation real and make difficult decisions uh, before going into residences. That's just my personal view. Thanks. A great project. Thanks very much, Reno. Any comments from you guys on that? Um, I think the one thing that we've just looked into, which like just to bring it up again, was so interesting was that to it seemed like the, the students who 
were in support of having alcohol in university reses were actually uh, it was linked to already having alcohol like hazardous alcohol use so it was what what it made us think at least in the discussions that kind of happened behind the scenes was that it almost seems like you need to target before you even get to um, that point it was like before you get to a point of hazardous alcohol use uh, you need to target it there because it was people who didn't have hazardous alcohol use according to our audit tool didn't seem to have a strong opinion that alcohol should be in reses. So it's almost like you need to start earlier than that than just, I agree that maybe um, policies of not having alcohol avail readily available in um, in reses because we, we did see a link between social settings and, and hazardous alcohol use. But even before that, it seems like the, the students who've already developed hazardous alcohol use then are the ones who are wanting to to keep drinking in reses, mm -hmm. so it's, it's difficult to see where interventions should be targeted. Mm -hmm. But yeah. because they like remember, I don't even remember, but in like, when you go watch rugby, I don't know if this is still the case, but I know in our earlier years of our degree, when we went to go watch rugby, you could only drink in a certain part of the mm -hmm. field, and for people who from I don't know, but they ordered to scoring. <laughs> and those who appear as though they wouldn't have had this drinking, it wasn't a problem. It was, oh, okay, it's fine, we'll just we'll drink elsewhere. But for some people, it was a big thing. I'm like, how are they not allowing me to go into the field? Like, I need to be able to have my, be on the field. So that is quite similar to, when yeah. I saw that, I was like, oh, I've actually experienced this when it came to supporting the IP today. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, uh, Ziki, I see your hand is up. Go for it. Uh, thanks, Nisha, and, th and congratulations to the students. Uh, Farhan has, has picked up on this point that I wanted to raise around um, the, the use of alcohol and um, incidents of, of gender-based violence. Um, when we, um, you know, we make alcohol accessible in, in our spaces, it's as though we are disregarding um, the, the challenges uh, that we face, or rather that are faced by the same group of students, uh, where then um, they, they, you know, um, they, they, they um, are then victimized um, following the, the consumption in spaces where they, you know, they occupied with uh, the perpetrators. So I think it's something that we need to take into consideration. But then as we're saying that, we also have to consider that we have pick and pay down the road as a supplier. Um, in Rondebosch, we have both pick and pay and, and checkers. So there is this constant flow of alcohol that is beyond the control of the university. So, I mean, even if we are going to limit what is available, um, perhaps rather we need to be educating students and um, engaging them on understanding their tolerance levels, you know, before, you know, they imbibe. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, indeed, that's a very um, important point, Ziki. I do personally think that Still, uh, if the university takes a hard line, it does send one specific message across, um, where the message is different if it's seen as completely acceptable. Um, but I agree with you that one needs to think of the external factors as well beyond the university. Um, and so it's very important to actually start the processes and interventions early on so that people are aware, etc. Um, but very important point. Any comments from, from Lucy and Robert? Yeah, I agree. I think that's what I was touching on earlier with where the interventions should be targeted. I think rather than removing alcohol entirely, they will, students will always find a way to get alcohol. So the, the education before it even gets to a point of hazardous drinking and then needing alcohol to be available in reses, etc. I think that the target needs to be education there. We did also see in our study that students who lived in reses or in, in privately, separately, sorry, not raises, but privately, separately from their parents um, or from any kind of supervision were more likely to have drunk in their lives. So it does need to be that there's support um, and there's education right from when students enter university when they're first, well, possibly first exposed to alcohol use at that level. Um, so that I agree with you that the education um, is probably the better target for interventions as opposed to hard and fast rules about where alcohol can be available because students will always find alcohol. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Um, thanks. Uh, Ishak, I see your hands up again. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting discussion. A couple of points. Uh, the one I, I think that um, for me, one of the interesting things that came from the results was, if I'm understanding the results correctly, is that there were students that felt that their own drinking was problematic, or, or, or there was a there was this kind of almost acknowledgement about problem drinking uh, um, among students. Uh, and for me, that could potentially be a key to action. So. If we were to conduct a future study like this, uh, we could perhaps look at linkages of where the study itself becomes a cue to action for, especially those students that, that themselves recognize their own problematic drinking uh, to be able to seek help. Um, uh, so that, 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 that's a, a kind of a structured uh, mechanism through which students, that cue to action can potentially lead to students wanting to change their own behavior. So that, that's kind of the, the carrot approach. Um, and, and so, you know, this, uh, with behavior change, is always a carrot and stick, and, and policy <laughs> is a stick. So um, uh, uh, there's, there's a barrier to obtaining alcohol, and some students would be more amenable to not drinking if there's a barrier as such. So if, that, if alcohol becomes freely available, they, they may just, just, you know, just have a few drinks. But if, it, if it's not freely available, that barrier of having to go to another site does result potentially in the reduction of, of usage of, of alcohol. But it's definitely, you know, behavior change is very complex. It requires intervention at multiple levels, individual um, kind of person and, and, and kind of at a policy level. So I, I don't think there's a one single intervention that, uh, that will necessarily uh, result in, in, in uh, significant reductions, but it will require multiple prongs, I think, uh, uh, to, 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 re to reduce, especially problematic alcohol usage. Yeah. Thanks, Isan. Any comments? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, Ishak I think if we did make a hard and fast rule, I think it would definitely decrease the amount of drinking because mm -hmm. I think it may is down the road, but it is further than, <laughs> you know, your room and raise it. And if you can't then take that beer to your room, then it is a bit of, okay, where do I drink? I almost if it's further, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going it, it, it does become an obstruction. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Are there any other comments or questions from anyone? Um, just having a look at the chat. Yeah, there are a few um, few comments about the importance of multifaceted interventions and not choosing one or the other, and a lot of congratulations for this amazing work. So, yeah, Fiona, I see your hands up. Go for it. Yes, I'd like to, my question is, what have you guys learned from this regarding alcohol? What is your take now? And how would you, going forward, when you're a doctor, how would you speak to someone in this position? Or if you meet a student coming to you and you suspect that they are alcohol dependent, what would you do? Great question, Fiona. Very, very, good, coming very, good. <laughs> very good question. A difficult question. I think one of the things that I valued about completing a study because it was literally in the population that I'm a part of was everybody has um, ideas of what they think alcohol use looks like among students. Even before we did the study, when we were just in public health discussing it, we could all say, yeah, I think students um, don't use alcohol responsibly always, or, or yes, I think there's a problem with alcohol use, but it was nice to actually see the numbers and see um, that like we had evidence that confirmed that. So for one thing, it was just valuable to me to see that I could um, have evidence in front of me confirming what most students already I think, believe. The other thing that I think moving forward is that um, education, because alcohol is so readily available and is so drinking is so normalized, um, we, um, it was interesting for me to see that it was the people who already have hazardous or harmful drinking practices and then they say they don't think they have harmful or hazardous drinking practices. So I think for me it showed me that alcohol education or um, just even just um, engaging in conversation with patients about alcohol and the potential harms of alcohol shouldn't just be when the patient already has hazardous or harmful drinking. I think it 
should be looked at like any drug where it should be an education that happens with any patient who uses alcohol because once it gets to the point where you're using alcohol in a harmful way, you may then start to sort of convince yourself yeah. that you're not. Yeah. We don't tell patients who smoke two cigarettes that that's okay. Like we tell them that any any amount that you smoke is really bad for you. So you stop them already then before they get to the yeah. I smoke a pack. Or well, at least yeah, the importance yeah. of informing patients of the harms that can come and how easy it is to get into hazardous drinking mm -hmm. patterns. Um, I think that was one of the big things for me. Um, yeah, I don't know if you. Yeah, we also we didn't know the standard units of alcohol, so yeah. we had to Google search that out like ourselves, and we realized that we actually had very similar responses to the students. So we also didn't think that. Yeah, it was as potent as it is, and that's spurs are more potent. Yeah. Um, so that was quite interesting because like the faculty that should know the most also doesn't know the most, probably because I think people just think binge drinking is just part of the university experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's for me, I realized I don't know how we're going to tackle that because I think that comes from like marketing and media showing that that's part of the varsity experience, and I think people feel like they, unless they binge drink, they're missing out on the university experience. So how do we change that lack of culture um, is going to be quite difficult. And then we also noticed just how subtle the advertising was and that it's easy to think that you aren't being influenced. So I don't know if I've mentioned brands, I'll go but there was a brand that I have the app so I can shop online and every Friday they would send me a message saying, Oh, you can order wine from us this Friday, every Friday. And I keep on sending the group screenshots say, guys, that's what's happening. Like, <laughs> I've never bought wine, I've never bought any alcoholic beverage online, and now I'm getting these ads all the time. So it's just quite interesting to know that like, they are trying to get us. <laughs> um, and we are not being influenced without realizing that we are. Yeah. Very interesting perspectives um, that you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, I don't see any other questions or comments um, online. Um, yes, and Memories just said some interventions need to address some of the reasons why students turn to drinking in the environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we noted the, some of the stresses mm -hmm. that you listed. Yeah. Any comments on that? What was interesting there was that the most common answer was no stresses. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting for us, even just whether you uh, read further into that and think where, where the students were genuinely believe that they have or generally have no stresses that directly lead to alcohol use or if they weren't able to acknowledge that link. So it might be that um, with sort of other drug use, people will have excuses in their minds for why what brought them there. But because alcohol is so normal and alcohol use is so normal, you might not have thought, why do I drink? Because everybody drinks. So I think that it's possible that it's also just good to have awareness or to encourage awareness in friends or in patients when we see them that when it, by the time it starts getting to hazardous alcohol use, there may well be reasons for that that you subconsciously, or that you're consciously aware of, or that you might have subconsciously. And just to kind of dig deeper into that, because there definitely are um, potential underlying reasons, even if people don't acknowledge them themselves, that could be addressed as well as part of an intervention. So, so medical students definitely end up block. <laughs> the end of the block is the yeah. alcohol consumption and the binge drinking rate yes. are probably at yeah. the high. Yes. Um, so, yeah. with yeah. the health science of students being majority of our students, that should have been reflected in the data. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Before we close, um, Liju, I've seen you've made some comments. Um, Liju, would you like to put your camera on and just um, share some of your thoughts as well? Because you're also part of the group um, and have been. Uh, patiently responding to many comments in the chat. Yeah, go for it, Lizzie, just unmute. Yeah, there we go. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so I feel like a lot has been said today. Um, <laughs> and there is like a very big um, drinking culture at UCT. Um, I was one of the students like was in the like resident system and you know uh, like always being invited to the party all the things that drinking is encouraged and like all the comments in the chat uh, you know it's not a a day or a rugby game without drink 
Oh, no. <laughs> there is quite a big drinking culture, and I don't think that it's it quite a lot of work. And yeah, I'm not even sure how one can go about it because it's not as simple as like addressing advertising. In our research, we saw there were a lot of people that mentioned advertising. But when I think about it also, it's it's like in movies itself, it's not a party, it's not a good time without drinking alcohol. Yeah, I feel like policy making regarding alcohol is not going to be easy. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Lidu. I think I think we all recognize the importance of a multifaceted approach. And I think even as, as students, um, you know, Dr. Date, who teaches health promotion, always says that health promotion is not education alone, mm -hmm. um, and the importance of other aspects as well. But uh, it's great to see our students themselves recognize this and the complexity of addressing these kind of problems. So one last question before we, uh, before we close, and it's a bit unrelated to alcohol now, it's more about the research process. I'm just curious to know whether you think other undergraduates should do research in the same way that you did? Or is it something more for students like you who are enthusiastic and motivated and got on well with your groups? And feel free to be perfectly honest, no social desirability bias because I'm your supervisor. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that we learned a lot through it, not just about the research process, although that was very interesting for us and we wouldn't have been exposed to it otherwise, but also about um, finding or the evidence-based Sort of nature of medicine and that we we couldn't just um, say things about alcohol use we actually had to learn how to look for evidence of, of what um of what we were trying to say or what we thought we believed and whether or not research actually backed that so even just that skill developing that skill going forward if you don't go into research at all you still need to be able to know how to find evidence for the practices that you're doing as an intern as a doctor moving forward um i also think uh, it's quite time consuming, to be honest. I'm not sure how we would manage to fit it in if, you were, if everybody was going to move forward with their project, but it is definitely something that I would encourage fourth years to move forward with as their electives, just because that is a great opportunity. And if you are um, willing to, to put in that work, we felt like there were lots of benefits that came out that we didn't even expect to have from completing the process and a lot of stuff that we um, had to learn as we went, which we didn't, you know, go into it thinking I want to learn this, but now we feel more confident in that. So I would definitely recommend it, and I, I think that it's a great process to go through, just building those skills of finding evidence, and then also if you want to go into research, it's particularly great because it's a good starting point to have a lot of support. <laughs> I also think it's like if I don't know who determines the qualifications for specialising, but we have to do an MED in order to specialise. And there have been many doctors who have clinical platform that have said, oh my, you know how to use Jamuri, that's going to be so helpful. I've been trying to figure this out now while working on the clinical platform. So I don't think it's any wasted skill. In fact, I think we've got quite an advantage. <laughs> we can do an MED. I have my old supervisor email and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And, yeah. Um, so it's been quite nice that we've realised that unless you like keep on working on a skill, you're going to lose it. So the fourth year knowledge by the time I don't know you're in your no thirties doing your in like do you remember this? Have you lost your notes? How are you going to yeah. move forward with this? So I do think it's yeah. useful skills, and I think many people will be specialising and will need to use those skills. So it doesn't feel like a waste of money. Fantastic, some great student um, perspectives and a really fantastic presentation. So just a round of applause again if you were getting a lot of uh, virtual applause as well. Um, and thank you everybody for joining um, and have a lovely rest of the week and weekend. Bye. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much.